agree with me on this one. When something bad happens, we normally like, you know, in our lives, we normally like our responses to be proportional, right? We don't want to blow things out of proportion. We don't want to go crazy or do anything like that. Allow me to show you how the United States does things proportionally. Ah, yes, the time that the U.S. Navy got upset and destroyed half of Iran's entire naval fleet in a single eight-hour workday. <laughs> Today we're talking about Operation Praying Mantis. But real quick, this video is sponsored by Zydax Custom Gaming PCs. They are all built right here in America with American-based tech support and a lifetime warranty. It's the computer that I use and the one that I would recommend. I'll have them linked down below if you want to check them out. Let's get to this video. All right, important background info. 1980, Iraq decided to invade Iran. Why? Don't really care. Not pertinent to the story. <laughs> However, at the end of that war, Iran decides, hey, we're going to pull a page out of the old Art of War by Sun Tzu. We're going to cut off the enemy supply lines, deprive the enemy of nice things. It's going to work out great. Iraq's got a weak navy. We're going to wipe out their navy. And then every time they send out an oil tanker through the Persian Gulf, we're going to blow that up. So they can't sell any liquid dinosaur. They can't make any money. They go broke. We win the war. Hooray. I... He's not the first man to call it liquid dinosaur, but I'm glad that someone does. It's a solid plan. So they do exactly that. Then Kuwait comes out of left field and they're like, hey, we've been financially backing Iraq through this entire war for the past seven years. We need to make sure they win so we can get our money back. So we're going to go ahead and let Iraq use our oil tankers to export oil. So Iran is like, well, that's an easy problem to solve. I'll just blow up all the Kuwaiti oil tankers as well, which is exactly what they do. But here's the catch. Kuwait at this point in time is like the one major exporter of oil that wasn't really part of OPEC, meaning that they were selling oil on the... Also, if you don't know what OPEC is, OPEC is a, um, for those who don't know, OPEC is a, um, is basically a coalition of countries that, um, handle the spreading of oil and stuff. And they're all like, uh, usually backed by the, at the time, backed by the Soviet Union and now backed by Russia, basically. That's what OPEC is. Father, I demand pets twice. Yes, yes, George, thank you for being patient. There's your first one, and there's your second one. Global market significantly do, but here's the catch. Kuwait at this point in time is like the one major exporter of oil that wasn't really part of OPEC, meaning that they were selling oil on the global market significantly cheaper than everybody else, driving down the entire oil market. And now that their oil tankers are getting blown up as well, it means that Kuwait can no longer sell oil on the cheap cheap, meaning that Iran has now inadvertently committed the cardinal sin of the late 20th century, raising gas prices. Now the entire Western world looks over at the Persian Gulf like, the fuck? <laughs> the ghost of Sun Tzu <laughs> Wait. cheap, cheap, meaning Wait, that Iran has now inadvertently committed the cardinal sin of the late 20th century, raising gas prices. Now the entire Western world looks over at the Persian Gulf like, the fuck? <laughs> that <laughs> that well, <laughs> I, I hate that we're... No, I don't hate it. I fucking love it. That's great. That is <laughs> just the eye of Sauron. Just hold on one more time. One more time. I'm sorry. I can't help it. That's too good. Gas prices. Now the entire Western world looks over at the Persian Gulf like the fuck. <laughs> so I d <laughs> the eye of NATO. Look, I don't think I need to explain why that's funny. If you don't get it. I'm sorry, but if you know, you know. The ghost of Sun Tzu's sitting there shaking his head like that's that's the one exception. I would have messed with any supply line except for that one because we all know what happens next. In God we trust, all others we track. Yeah, America then proceeds to assemble the largest naval convoy operation since World War II, send them into the Persian Gulf to protect Kuwaiti oil tankers. It is at this moment that Iran should have been like, well, that's unfortunate, time to figure out plan B because this obviously is not going to work out. However, they decide that they're gonna double down. What they're gonna do is they're gonna take a bunch of magnetic underwater mines and they're just gonna spread them out all over the Persian Gulf in international waters and that's not gonna have any consequences. I should point out that by international law, uh, m laying a minefield is basically not only a declaration of war, and, but it's also illegal to do it in international waters. 
at all. So fast forward April 14th, 1988, the USS Samuel B. Roberts, a guided missile frigate, which is basically brand new at this point, this is like its first big operation, is out there escorting a Kuwaiti oil tanker and it runs into a minefield, hits a mine, blows up the keel of the ship. The hey look, that frigate's doing its job, a duty honorably discharged. <laughs> keel is this bottom part right here it like supports and stabilizes the structure of the entire ship and it gets blown completely in half at this point the only thing holding this boat together is the actual deck one second everything's fine the next second there's a 15 foot wide hole in the bottom of your ship everything's on fire and water is rushing in the uss samuel b roberts took on half of its weight in water in the first minute this is a catastrophic amount of damage that would sink 99 percent of ships but as fate would have it the crew of the uss samuel b roberts had already been winning competitions for having the best damage control crew in the navy so the entire crew gets to work they're putting out fires they're plugging holes they're literally cinching the hole together with steel cables trying to stabilize it because the only thing holding it together is a deck at this point over the course of the next five hours the entire crew fights their ass off and somehow manages to get the situation under control and limp the ship all the way back to dubai where they can get it to a port and the most incredible part of all of it not a single American was killed. Only 10 men were injured during the fire and the initial explosion. So the crew survived. The boat's basically completely destroyed. Then America sends in an underwater crew, figure out what happened. They find the remnants of the mine. They check out the other mines. Yep, they're Iranian. At this point, now somebody has to inform the president because this is a big deal. And the president at this point in time is, let me check my notes, uh, fucking Ronald Reagan. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. I should mention the context of the rest of that quote. The quote goes, the one thing you never want to hear is, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. But yes, Ronnie Reagan is president. So I'm sure he'll come up with a proportional response. So they go ahead and they brief Ronald Reagan on everything that happened. He's super happy that everybody survived. And he's like, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to issue a proportional response. And what the U.S. Navy heard was, I All right, so here's the plan. I, <laughs> I certainly has three oil rigs in the Persian Gulf that are not being used for drilling oil, but as military bases for their naval operations. So the U.S. Navy is going to go ahead and take out all three of those. Now, I don't really know what the guided missile frigate to oil rig exchange ratio is, but we're going to go ahead and err on the side of caution and say that it's not quite proportional enough yet. Proportional. So Iran also really only has like two modern naval vessels. That's the Iranian frigate Sahand and the Iranian frigate Sabatland. They're going to go ahead and take out at least one of those, maybe both. We'll see how proportional they want to get. And then by the time they get all that done, that should be a nice eight hour work day. It'll be time to clock out and go get some ice cream. So in order to get all this done by quitting time, they're going to go ahead and establish three different surface attack groups. Each group is going to have two destroyers and one bonus ship. That bonus ship is either going to be an amphibious landing ship or a frigate. Either way, they're all going to be identified as Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. Bravo group is tasked with taking out two oil rigs. Charlie group is tasked with taking out the one remaining oil rig. And Delta's mission is to go hunt down those two frigates and take them out. And then just for insurance purposes, we're also going to have the USS Enterprise parked right outside the Persian Gulf to provide air support. Because why the fuck not? And if you need someone to provide air support, you goddamn better get the Enterprise. You know, in case we need it. So, April 18th, 1988, four days after the mining of the USS Samuel B. Ro yes, the Big E is called in for this operation. Mind you, for those who don't know, Enterprise at this point, the USS Enterprise is probably like, well, she's probably one of the oldest carriers in the fleet at this point. Um, because she was commissioned, or like USS Enterprise CVN-65, which is the carrier you were just shown. CVN-65 was uh, is an old ship. Remember, she was only decommissioned and scrapped, uh, I think, last a few years ago. And she was in service up until the 21st century. So she was an old ship. Um, but yes, to serve on the Enterprise is considered an honor. Like, it was a privilege. So, yeah, if these guys are showing up, yeah. Oh, one other thing. Uh, you'll see that being on the Enterprise, I guess, transfers over some of the soul of the old World War II ship. Because the pilots are just as crazy. 
Roberts, Operation Praying Mantis goes into full swing, and Bravo Group shows up at their oil rig first. At which point they radio over to the oil rig and inform them that they will be blowing it up in five minutes and that they should all leave. So, a bunch of people start leaving. They hop in tugboats and take off. Bravo Group, seeing that they're making an honest effort to actually evacuate, agrees to give them 15 more minutes. So, fast forward 20 minutes later, they send out another radio message, hey, Time's up. They then fire the five inch guns right over the top of the oil rig with the round set to air burst, hopefully scaring off any stragglers. And it is at this point that some Iranian military member decides that he is going to audition to be the main character of this story because he hops on a 23 millimeter anti-aircraft gun and opens fire on Bravo Group. And without skipping a beat, one of the five inch guns on one of the destroyers just goes, Nyeh! Poof, and just fucking direct hit smokes this dude. Barely touches the rest of the oil rig, this guy, Definitely not the main character, but the silver lining, he at least made it into the credits as Baloney Mist Cloud number one. <laughs> Baloney Mist Cloud number one. Jesus, dude. I mean, I mean, you're not wrong, but do you have to describe it? Ah, screw it. Look, if that moron was dumb enough to get on a small anti-aircraft gun like that and think, yeah, I'm totally going to fight off, totally going to fight off this, uh, these two destroyers. Y yeah, he deserved that. Now, obviously, I'm paraphrasing here, but at this point, Bravo Group radios over to the oil rig one last time, something along the lines of, hey, does anybody else need to find out what it's like to chew five gum? Are you fuckers ready to quit? The oil rig finally radios back and is like, yeah, yeah, please cease fire. We're going to leave. So all the Iranian military members leave. Bravo Group decides to open up on it for a little bit with the five inch guns before sending over a couple of Hueys full of Marines. The Marines hop out, place some demo charges, hop back on the helicopters, take off. The entire oil rig blows up and already things are getting more proportional. Proportional. And while happening, Charlie Group made it to their first oil rig as well and pretty much the exact same thing played out. The only differences were Charlie Group didn't have Marines to place the demo charges, they had Navy SEALs, and when the Iranians opened up with the 23 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, they just decided to keep firing five inch shells at the oil platform until it burst into flames and burnt the entire thing to the ground. At which point, the commander of the destroyer kind of looks over at the Navy SEALs and is like, sorry, I guess you guys get to sit this one out. Oh, mission got canceled? Good. And while all <laughs> Oh, mission got canceled? Good. That's going down. Bravo Group's already making their way over to the third oil rig, at which point they pick up something on radar, and it's definitely another enemy ship headed right towards them. And at this point, you have to remember, this is the late 1980s. None of the American sailors have seen naval warfare on this scale. The pucker factor is on. They are getting harpoon missiles ready, and they are about to get in, like, one of the biggest naval fights since World War II. At which point, whoever's in charge of Bravo Group decides to take a deep breath, and they're like, Okay, let's just, let's send up a helicopter real quick just to verify that it's actually an enemy ship. So the helicopter goes up, radios back to Bravo Group. It's definitely a warship, but it's a Soviet destroyer. At which point everybody's like, what? What is happening right now? So they radio over to this Russian destroyer and they're like, what are your intentions? And the Russian commander radios back in broken English. I swear to God, this is a real quote. I'm just here to take pictures. What? Wait, wait, I'm just here to take pictures. <laughs> so, wait a minute. So, you so you see all this shit going down. You're in a Soviet ship. Mind you, American and Soviet relations are not the best right now in the 80s. And you're ballsy enough, or I guess stupid enough, probably both, ballsy and stupid, to say, I'm here to take pictures. Um, yeah, no, Lich King's right. Russia sees this go down, it's like, alright, popcorn, we're just gonna watch this play out. Can you imagine this destroyer, like, this, probably a silver mini, yeah, a silver mini destroyer, just crew, oh, they're okay, okay, well, in the 1980s, relationships are okay, but can you imagine this silver mini destroyer just cruising past these oil, these oil derricks, and just snapping photos, just like, don't do anything? Don't antagonize them. Don't touch the boats. Just take pictures. That's actually pretty funny. For history. Look, I know that I bash on the Soviet Union and communism every single chance I get, but this time around, I gotta give it to them. These guys know how to party. Just straight up rolling into the middle of the largest naval operation since World War II to eat popcorn and watch. 
It's incredible. At this point, Iran finally figures out that there's something going on, but they don't really know what, so they just begin attacking any ship they can find, and the first ship they found was a civilian cargo ship called the Willy Tide, that they begin attacking with bog hammer style speedboats. So the Willy Tide radios for help, the USS Enterprise responds by sending up a bunch of A6 intruders, as well as F-14 Tomcats. The A6 intruders show up, start dropping cluster bombs, they end up hitting one of the speedboats and scattering the rest. The civilian cargo ship is saved, hooray, cutting back to Charlie group, now there's an Iranian fast attack ship coming right at them. So they radio over like, hey, yeah, we're kind of going around blowing up all your stuff, but also we've got a very specific list. You're not on it. So how about you just go away and we'll forget we saw you. The Iranian fast attack ship messages back, sounds good, we'll do that. And then they just keep driving right towards them. And then this Iranian fast attack ship gets within like 15 miles of Charlie group, which is like point blank range for a naval battle. Charlie group radios again, dude, what? are you doing? To which they respond, I'm following orders. And then they proceeded to lock their radar on Charlie Group, which Charlie Group can see. At which point Charlie Group immediately launches five missiles directly at the Iranian vessel. The Iranian vessel fires a harpoon missile back at Charlie Group. Both groups now have missiles in the air screaming towards one another. The Americans launch countermeasures shooting up chaff rockets that end up catching the harpoon missile, detonating it in midair. The Iranian vessel, on the other hand, did not have any countermeasures capable of stopping the newer technology behind the American missiles and it would end up getting sunk pretty much immediately. Then yeah, oh my god, you fucking been it clowns, bro before anybody can really even fully digest what just happened, Radar picks up three Iranian F-4s screaming towards Charlie Group. Oh no, F-4 Phantoms in the ninth in 1980, whatever will we do? Look, the Phantom is a cool plane. The Phantom is a badass plane for its time. It's fast. It's bulky. It has... It has missiles. Not not good missiles, but it has missiles. And certain models of the F-4 do have a gun. Mounted externally. But regardless, the F-4 is still bleedingly fast. For its time. Charlie Group then turns fires a bunch of surface-to-air missiles at the F-4s. The F-4s see them coming. They're like, oh shit, they pop a U-turn and try to outrun them. F-4s, while they are extremely fast, can't outrun missiles, so one of the missiles ends up blowing a wing off one of the F-4s. Now America has taken out an entire naval vessel and an F-4 that they did not plan on taking out, and it's throwing off all of our proportions. And because of that, American leadership orders Bravo Group to stand down. We're not gonna go take out that third oil rig. And right as soon as that order gets given out, Delta Group chimes in is like, hey, we found that frigate we were looking for. So now nobody knows what to do because on one hand, things are already getting out of control, but on the other hand, we really want to take out these frigates. So American leadership decides, well, we might not even have to make a hard decision. Maybe that's not even the frigate and the radar's wrong. Why don't you go ahead and send a couple A6 intruders over, do a flyby. They can verify that it's actually this new modern frigate. And if it is, we'll make a decision from there. You sent... I'm sorry, you sent A6 intruders on a scouting mission to identify a target, a combat target, mind you. You you do know that strike aircraft guys are picked because of their aggressive attitudes, their desire for combat, and their skill at aggressive action, right? That That's kind of the whole point. So you literally sent up guys who want to fight, who are looking to fight, and you just tell them, oh, don't do anything. Just go see if it's a combat vessel or not. And you expect them to do nothing? Like, bruh. Let's see. Right over the top of them. They can fire ship. So it is we'll make a decision from there yeah. or so they thought because the a6 pilots are about to decide that they are in fact the main characters yep. of this story you see the uss enterprise and its aircraft aren't really supposed to be doing a whole lot they're more or less just there for insurance in fact they're only allowed to engage the enemy under one of two conditions one the president of the united states signs off on it which is actually what happened with the speedboats earlier or two hey gun sage how you doing, buddy? Welcome, Raiders. I'm Zero Quinn Caller. Uh, tonight, we're reacting to a bunch of random things on YouTube. Y'all have caught us right in the middle of uh, the fat electrician's 
a video on Operation Praying Mantis, aka America obliterates half of Iran's navy in a workday due to a proportional response. So, yeah, sit back, relax, make yourself at home. They get fired upon first. So, they got told to go fly by this boat to verify that it is, in fact, the new modern frigate, but... They didn't get told how to fly by the boat, so they drop down 50 feet above the water and just gun it and they buzz the entire ship. So the ship opens fire with its AA guns, but these planes are so low to the water, the AA guns can't actually aim down low enough, so all the anti-aircraft fire goes right over the top of them. They continue to stay low enough till they get out of anti-aircraft gun range, and then they pull up, at which point the ship launches a bunch of surface-to-air missiles at them. They drop chaff as a countermeasure, takes care of those, no big deal. Oh, we're under attack. I guess that means we get to fight back now. <laughs> oh, we're taking fire. We have to engage. They then go around, do a U-turn, send a radio message to this frigate. I'm going to sink you now. Which they can now legally do, because remember, the ship fired on them first. You fell victim to one of the classic blunders. So the A-6 fires an anti-ship harpoon missile, and the second they pull the trigger on that, the fire control team from the USS Enterprise is like, what? The fuck are you doing? We're not supposed to be killing things yet. And the A6s are like, look, they fired at us first. Them's the rules. And the USS Enterprise is like, holy shit. Okay, I guess. Let them have it. Then the harpoon missile finally makes impact. It's a bullseye. The A6s do a U-turn, go, drop another 500-pound laser-guided bomb right through the deck of this frigate, fly past it, do another U-turn, come back, drop a 1,000-pound bomb on it. Then they raise- Jesus, guys, calm down! ...video over to the Enterprise and like, yeah, it's definitely gonna sink. We're gonna head back. So the A6s take off, headed back to the Enterprise, and like five minutes later, Delta Group shows up with their warships and begin firing on the already sinking frigate. They hit the magazine the frigate explodes rapidly sinks to the ocean floor okay so so to reiterate a harpoon missile a 500 pound laser guided bomb a 1000 pound laser guided bomb and then the destroyer show the two delta group destroyers show up and are like oh we want some of that and proceed to pound a sinking ship with five inch shells until it blows up at this point, naval leadership is like, okay, Jesus Christ, everybody stop killing things. We need to figure out what all happened. I'm sorry, are you ask? wait, are you asking or telling? Because if you're asking them to stop killing things, that's not going to work. If you're telling them to stop killing things, uh, th that's not going to work either. <laughs> so we got to keep this proportional. Proportional. Remember. Proportional. So they start radioing back and forth, everybody's figuring out what everybody did, if anybody's hurt, what's going on, the whole story. And then as the A6s are making their way back to the USS Enterprise, guess what they happen to fly past? The other modern frigate. So now the entire US Navy is looking at this last frigate like SpongeBob looking at a jug of water. I don't need it. I don't need it. I need it. But also like. I would also say that it was just like those seagulls from Finding Nemo. Mine. 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 Like realistically speaking, the A6s are pretty much out of ammunition. The only thing they have left are 2,000 pound bombs, and those just aren't going to be enough by themselves without a harpoon missile to take down this ship anyways, so they really are just going to fly by and verify that it's the modern frigate. So the A6 intruders go ahead, they do their flyby, it is in fact the new frigate that they thought it was, and it does in fact open fire on the A6s. A6s make it out completely unscathed, at which point they pop a U-turn and one of the A6 pilots is like, hmm. I used to bullseye womp rats in my T-16 back home. So the A6- <laughs> I used to bullseye womp rats in my T-16 back home up gaining altitude and then dives down aims its nose right at the frigate at like a 35 degree angle they're doing a good old-fashioned dive bombing run like it's fucking world war ii the aa guns start firing there's bullets whizzing past the plane but they're committed now they're closing in closing in the bombardier behind the pilot lets the pilot know hey i'm locked on at which point bombs away the pilot pulls up and the bomb goes right down the fucking smokestack of this boat. Blows up, completely destroying the entire engine room. That frigate is now dead in the water with no power. The A6s go ahead and radio in that they have completely disabled this frigate, at which point the American leadership calls a complete ceasefire. They're gonna go ahead and let that frigate survive get towed off, potentially be repaired. With the US Navy having effectively disabled or destroyed over half of Iran's functioning Navy, the US military decides to call it a good day, ends Operation Praying Mantis, we all get to live happily ever after. 
Except, later that night, Iran decided that they wanted to fight a little bit more, and they launched a bunch of silkworm anti-ship missiles at American vessels. Luckily, no American vessels were actually hit, however, this is now a huge political problem because America has been mad at the fact that Iran even had silkworm missiles for years at this point, and the American government has made it very clear to Iran that if they ever used them, they would be going to war with America, period, that's set in stone. So the Reagan administration, not wanting to kick off World War III in the 1980s, reaches out to the Iranian government and is like, here's what's going to happen. You're going to go ahead and admit that that was an accident. I'm going to sweep it under the rug and we're never going to talk about it again. Because if this makes headline news and the American people find out, I'm going to have to get real proportional around here. So Iran's like, okay, fine, whatever. It was an accident. Let's sweep that whole thing under the rug. But I am still going to take America to international court to try to prove that it was a war crime to take out my oil rigs. That way I can get reparations and make America pay for it. So they go to international court. They lay out the case. The international court is looking at America like, okay, well, first of all, you're the first fraction people. I don't know how you think that this is proportional, proportional, but it definitely wasn't. Second of all, according to the Amity Act, you absolutely should not have attacked their oil rigs. This is probably a war crime. At which point the representative for America is like, well, actually, if you read the Amity Treaty between Iran and the United States, it only talks about ships and boats. It don't say shit about oil rigs, meaning I wasn't obligated to not attack those oil rigs. At which point the court is like, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <sighs> Fucking, he's right, son. Don't you love legal loopholes? I mean, I usually hate them, but in this case, you gotta love them, right? You gotta love that stuff. Of a bitch. Okay, well, I guess America's innocent because I've said it once and I'll say it again. It's never a war crime the first time. And now <laughs> I want that shirt. It's never a war crime the first time for the best part of the entire story, America now proceeds to go over to Dubai, pick up what's left of the USS Samuel B. Roberts, tow it all the way back to Maine, then take the ship out of the water, get it in dry dock, cut out the entire damaged section of the ship, including the engine compartment, build another module to fit in its place. This thing weighs like 300 tons. They jack it up, weld it right where it's at, get everything rehooked up, reconnected. And this boat is back out on the ocean one year later on April 1st, 1989. It then goes on to get recommissioned and serves in the Navy until 2015. I mean, playing Battleship against America's gotta suck, right? Like, haha, I've sunk your frigate, and America's like, first of all, no you didn't. Second of all, fuck your entire Navy as it picks up your board and just throws it at the wall. So in conclusion, yeah. if you do ever find yourself being the leader of a foreign nation one day, the best advice that I can possibly give you is A, do whatever you can to not raise gas prices, and B, whatever you do, do not fuck with America's boats. We do not like that shit. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is like, comment, subscribe. Maybe go buy some merch at thefatelectrician.com. Quack, bang, out. I f again, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I love the quote, don't fuck with the, with, don't fuck with our boats.